Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before the Bible reading, I just quickly want to bring to our attention uh, some special information we have for the church. Uh, we should be reminded uh, that our global crusade continues. Uh, so this evening, uh, this morning, we'll still be part, we'll still partake of the blessings uh, from the headquarters. And then after that, later in the evening, we'll still converge together on the Zoom platform by 5 p.m. Let's endeavor to join. And what's the theme of this uh, global crusade? Emmanuel. And I pray that Emmanuel will reveal himself to us and his presence will make us overcomers and conquerors in all our endeavors in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the global crusade continues tomorrow as well. Uh, unlike before, it will be 6 p.m. Don't forget, this is uh, a combo, like our pastor used to say. So we will be having the retreat, December retreat, and the global crusade. So it starts by 5 p.m. this time around on today, Monday, and then Tuesday as we round off. I uh, will also be reminded that the Wonder Dot will be having an end of the year wash night service. I'm mean, sorry, worship service. They call it worship night. I'm sorry, the worship night service comes next Sunday, please. Uh, so the worship night comes up this Friday, uh, 6 p.m. in this same auditorium. Uh, all are invited. So though it, the program is meant for young adults, but they are inviting the entire church to be part of this uh, worship night. Uh, they also want us to know that the singles conference will come up uh, 9 to 11 of February 2024 if the Lord tarries at Princeton, North Carolina. Uh, registration has been dead free. So all singles are encouraged to register in this regard. And also uh, all young adults should please wait behind the service to see their coordinator. It's time for Bible reading. Hebrews chapter 1. And two. A letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son this day have I begotten thee and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Hebrews 2 Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time...
found in the wise, uplifting the meek, blessing the poor, give a strength to the weak, whatever. Just reach out and touch him, cause it passes by. The healer is here, the healer is here. Let your faith rise from all doubt and fear. The healer is here, Jesus, the healer is here. As God's Fire, a baptizer, Emmanuel, Jesus, the sanctifier. We're asking, Lord, that your word will penetrate every heart and reach and reach every heart, even this morning, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Good, good, amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Today, we come to the subject of Jesus that's Emmanuel, Jesus, the sanctifier. Jesus only, Jesus ever. Jesus all in all was he, the savior, the sanctifier, his healer, and his baptizer, and he is the coming king. Jesus, our sanctifier, cleansing us from self and sin, and with all his spirit's fullness, Filling all our hearts within. Sanctification deals with sin, inbred sin, inward sin, the sin that we are born with. In sin did my mother conceive me, and in sin was I born. There is that nature of sin. And when we begin to live, when we begin to, you know, practice how to relate with people, how to interact with people, then the branches of sin will begin to shoot out. And those are the works of the flesh. When we get saved, those branches are cut off. When we give our life, our heart to the Lord, those branches of sin, those works of the flesh, those external items of sin, one by one in the plural, they are forgiven, they are cleansed, they are taken away. At sanctification, the root of sin, the inbred sin, the inward sin is dealt with. And God needs to deal with both the branches and the root before we can see him on the final day. That's why it says that blessed are the pure in heart. It's the purity of heart that takes away that root of sin. That's why it says Jesus is our sanctifier.
cleansing us from self internally and sin inwardly. That's what he does. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at Emmanuel, Jesus, the sanctifier. We read from Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verse 9. It says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He died for everyone. Why? To save us from transgression, from sin, from the outward expression, the branches on the tree of sinfulness. That's why he died. Number two is to uproot, to get rid of that root of sin, of the inbred sin, of the nucleus, of the origin, and of the very beginning and the source of the flow of sin in our lives. He died to save. He died to sanctify. I was told in verse 10, in verse 10 it says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. It takes salvation and sanctification, forgiveness and freedom, the holiness of heart that he produces and generates in our heart that he will bring us to glory and to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Then in verse 11, it says, For both he that sanctified, it says, he sanctified. He that sanctified, and they who are sanctified, they believers, saved, and sanctified. They who are sanctified are all of one. Sanctification brings us to oneness with the sanctifier, with other sanctified believers. Sanctify them through thy truth that they all may be one. And when they were in one accord, in one place, the Holy Ghost came upon them. Sanctification brings us in unity for the sanctifier, oneness for the sanctifier, and oneness, unity, agreement, togetherness with all who are sanctified. And it says, which, for which cause is not ashamed to call them the brethren. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm looking at verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify his people with his own blood. When we're saved, because of the blood they are shed, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And when you see the blood that was shed for us, and we believe in that blood that was shed for us, we're saved. All those sins, transgressions, iniquities, they're forgiven and they're taken away. And then now, that same blood has the power that same blood has the cleansing power to sanctify us. Because it says, Jesus also is done the first work of grace. And now he comes to do the second work of grace with his own blood. It's offered without the gate. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, let us go forth, therefore, we're saved, we need to desire, we need to run after, we need to seek the sanctification experience. We go forth, therefore, unto him, without the camp, outside the camp, bearing 
his reproach. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, for here on earth we have no continuing city. The reason why we seek to be saved is that we know that we're not going to live on earth forever. And the reason why we seek the holiness experience, the sanctification, the cleansing of the self and the sin, and the removal of the carnal nature in our heart is so that when we live here, we'll be able to see him in glory. Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. For here, we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Emmanuel, Jesus, the sanctifier. We're looking at three things. Number one is the experience of sanctification. Number two is the evidence of sanctification. Number three is the experience from the expectation from the sanctifier. The experience, we go to the Lord like we had an experience of salvation. So we go to the Lord to have the experience of sanctification. Like we have the evidence of salvation. We also demonstrate and we express and we show forth the evidence of sanctification. Number three, that we have the expectation from the Savior that if he has saved us, here is what he expects. In the same way, when he sanctifies us, he has expectation, the expectation from the sanctifier. Look at number one. Number one is the experience of sanctification, the experience of sanctification. But told in Leviticus chapter 20, reading from verse 7, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7, sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. You'll see right there the connection between sanctification and holiness. Here is the command of the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, And ye shall keep my statutes, and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. You find that word sanctify in verse 7, sanctify yourself. You find that word sanctify in verse 8, I am the Lord which sanctify you. The same word, different meanings. Sanctify yourself, set yourself apart. I'm the Lord that sanctify you. I am the Lord that makes you holy, holy on the inside, holy in the heart, holy in your disposition. The word sanctify has two meanings, therefore. And you'll find as you read the Bible that a sanctuary, a building is sanctified. Now the building has no sin, has no moral defilement. But the building is set apart, is sanctified for God's use only. And when it says, sanctify yourself, set yourself apart for God's use. You so set yourself apart that Satan will not have any inroad into your life to make use of you. You so set yourself apart that self, pride, the Adamic nature will not have access unto you to make use of you. You so set yourself apart that the evil society, the world in which we live, will not have 
any use of you. Sanctify yourself. Dedicate yourself and consecrate yourself unto the Lord that he and he alone will have the free, full, final use of your life. And then it's when you do that, you show your desire, you show your expectation, and you show your passion for that sanctification of the Lord. And now he says, I am the Lord which sanctify you. It now makes you holy. It purifies you. It purges your heart. It purges your life. And you have experience of sanctification. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 26, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify. He, the sanctifier. He, Jesus. He, the one who had saved us already, who now sanctifies us at a second definite word of grace, that he might sanctify and cleanse. When he sanctifies, he cleanses us on the inside. That stain, Adamic stain, that stain, the bad marks, were born with. He removes, he cleanses, he purges, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. He had been through the word which has spoken unto you. Then in verse 27, that result of sanctification is that he might present it that the church to himself a glorious church. We're saved when the church, if that's all what the church knows, salvation, 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 gracious church. The grace of God in our life teaches us to deny outward, external ungodliness. But now, it sanctifies us so that it will take us beyond being a gracious church to a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Wrinkle is the mark, the evidence of the old man. And when there's wrinkle on the face, it's not just the face, it affects the brain. It's not just the brain, it affects the flow of liquid in the body. And it's not just the wrinkle, the wrinkle is just the evidence that the old man, old age, has come. And all that, the wrinkling, brings also the internal weakness. The weakness the old man cannot run or jump, the hurdle like he used to do many years ago. The wrinkle then is the mark of the old man in the life of the saint. This weakness there, sometimes thoughtlessness there, sometimes there's weak eyesight. The vision is blurred, old man, wrinkled, and the passion is also dimmed. The hearing, old man, hearing is affected. When he sanctifies, he takes away the wrinkle, the mark of the old age. A dim of vision and the decreasing of passion and it takes away the blockage of the flow of the word of God in our heart in our life not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy sanctification brings holiness of heart and it says, without blemish. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, reading there from verse 12. It says, here is what Christ has done. Jesus also, that he might sanctify 
the people. Now, he does not sanctify building. We do that. We set the building apart. He does not sanctify instruments. We do that. We set that instrument apart. We say this instrument is dedicated to the worship of the Lord, sanctified. This instrument will only play music, tunes that will honor God, exalt God. This instrument will not glorify itself and will not minister to the carnal emotions of the flesh. We do that, but God sanctifies the people. Not instrument, not building. It sanctifies the people who are saved. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. In verse 13, it says, let us go, let us pray, let us seek, let us ask, let us demand, we have a part to play in having the experience of sanctification. We drop every other thing because after all, all those other things will not take us to heaven. We have to be saved to get to heaven. And if we're involved with this, this, and that, and we're not saved yet, the greatest of wisdom in our lives to drop all those things and to get saved. If we're not sanctified, purified, cleansed, made holy at heart, it's the greatest of wisdom to drop every other thing that occupies our attention. Drop them so that we go forth and we seek and we pray and we consecrate and we seek the Lord until we are sanctified. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Verse 14, for here on earth, here in our existence, we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And it is because of that we pray, we seek his face, so we can have this experience of sanctification. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Even before sanctification, we're saved. And because we're saved, and we're telling the Lord we need a deeper experience now how are we going to ask him for a deeper experience if the deep experience of salvation is not evident abstain from all appearance of evil before we seek the higher experience the better experience and the greater experience will manifest that we already have the good experience of salvation and as much as possible, whatever we know to be evil, whatever we know to be an appearance of evil, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, if somebody does not abstain from evil, he cannot go to the next verse and expect sanctification. If somebody does not abstain from what he knows that other people will judge, will estimate that that's an appearance of evil. That man, that woman, that does not show that he has the heart, the desire, and the expression of life to abstain from evil, from appearance of evil, from all appearance of evil, he should go back and consolidate his salvation consolidate the experience of salvation and then after that verse 23 it says and the very god of peace would have given us peace in our heart peace with the lord and peace in the lord we would have experienced the peace of god in our heart 
justified. No restlessness in the heart. No disturbance in the heart. No conflict in the heart. He has peace with God. And he has the peace of God. And the God of peace sanctify you holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. That means completely. Sanctify you completely. Sanctify you totally. Sanctify you thoroughly. Sanctify you entirely. When we come to the Lord, we're not asking for a superficial sanctification. When you are sanctified, you don't, you don't get angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what if you are not sanctified and you are saved? You get angry. He that is angry with his brother, that's a cause to be in danger of the judgment of God. Anger is dealt with. Anger is one of the branches of the tree we're talking about. And wickedness and cruelty is one of the branches of the tree of sin we spoke about earlier. Salvation takes that away. If you are beating your wife, if you are tormenting your husband, if you are getting angry at non-essentials, even at essential things, there's concern about your salvation. When we are saved, we love. We love our wives, we love our husbands, we love our children, we love members of the church, and we love our leaders. We love our leaders to the point of obeying them as they teach us the word of God. If that is not there, and there is, you know, that anger oozing out, go back to the cross. Reconsolidate the experience of salvation here sanctification the very god of peace sanctify you holy thoroughly entirely completely totally inwardly and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless after that sanctification god has not stopped working continues to preserve you blameless every day every week and every moment of your life why because at any moment christ can come and we need to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord and because he can come at any time as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the son of man be who are eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage and they were you know doing this and that until the flood came took them on unawares and because we know the coming of the lord will be like that after we are saved after we are sanctified we remain in that experience of sanctification it says preserved blameless unto until the coming of our lord Jesus Christ had the kind of experience that Enoch had in Hebrews chapter 11, reading there from verse 5. Hebrews 11, verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. The sanctified heart, the sanctified life pleases God. The life that is sanctified and every moment of his life, morning, afternoon, and evening, in every situation, all his action, all his attitude, everything he does, pleases God sanctified it doesn't take time off not to please the Lord it doesn't say Lord of course we don't say that directly but actions speak louder than the voice Lord I need to take time off I need to please myself I'm hungry of self-praise 
I'm hungry of self pride. I'm hungry of self recognition. Lord, I take time off to please myself. There's no certification there. I take time off to please society. My people have been wondering what's happening. They're not pleasing us anymore. What's happening? They're not going away anymore. They're putting pressure on me. So, Lord, give me a chance. I need to please society a little. Sanctification doesn't accept that. I want to please my flesh. <laughs> like, if my flesh is, you know, crying out, give me this, give me this. You're denying me of pleasure. And so, God, I'm sorry, I need to attend to this. I'll come back. I need to please the flesh. Sanctification makes us to please God in everything, at all times. And we tell self, tell the society, and tell the flesh, there is no time to please you anymore because now we're dedicated unto the Lord, we want to please the Lord every time it tells us in first thessalonians chapter 2 reading from verse 10 first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10 here witnesses and god also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe what do you see there ye are witnesses you members of the Thessalonian church, ye are witnesses. They're witnesses of his salvation. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you. How long is the preacher with the members? Not out of half of the day. Even if he preaches two hours, not half of the day. Even if he prays and interacts and counsels three hours, not half of the day, he'll go to sleep. He'll go to, you know, have time apart by himself. And we don't know what he's doing at that time, but as we see him in the open, salvation is demonstrated. That's all we can judge is outward action, is outward behavior. Ye are witnesses is the witness of salvation. The salvation we have that has cut off all those branches of unacceptable behavior, the anger, and the bullying on people, and the control that is lost. Now, all that, we can see that on the outside. But the sanctification, he said, you are witnesses of my outward life. But now you are witnesses and God also. God witnesses to the sanctified heart. That one you cannot see. But God is witness. How holily, holy from the inside. Just from a principle from the inside unblameable from the nature the new nature the lord had given him that sanctification that god also witnesses to he knows what men do not know he knows what our members do not know how do the members know the relationship between the pastor and his wife they won't know how will the members know the inward thought and the inward plan and the inward projection in the heart that is not spoken out, they won't know what God knows. How does God know? The inward depravity that when we come out and want to be dignified, we suppress. And there are things, many things, people suppress. I cannot relate with that sister openly as I'm feeling inside. I suppress that in the open. But God knows what's inside, which we're trying to suppress. When we're saved, outward life, holy. Outward life, just. Outward life, unblameable. When we're sanctified, God that sees on the inside, he looks at the heart and he says, 
that hath his holy and just and unblameable for the believers and even outside the believers circle daniel chapter 6 we're reading there from verse 3 in daniel chapter 6 verse 3 then this daniel not every daniel in the world this daniel this one that lived in babylon and he had the grace of god and nebuchadnezzar of the magicians of the people around him could not see any blemish on the outside this daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was found in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm he said this man is a dependable man a trustworthy man a man you can leave all your property and close your eyes and nothing will happen to the property he was saved look at verse 4 in verse 4 it says then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against this daniel against daniel saved and sanctified concerning the kingdom but they could not they could find none occasion no fault for as much as he was faithful neither was there any error or fault found in him old testament how about the new testament believers how are we doing no fault no error no deliberate action that's you know it was an error not daniel when we are saved we're so careful in our lives we're conscious of that salvation and we carry that salvation in everything that we do and then we're told in verse 5 verse 5 then said these men we shall not find any 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 occasion against this daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his god he knew that this man will not budge he will not compromise he will not shift away from the law of his god they studied him externally openly and they knew he will not play with his relationship of salvation with the lord look at verse 22 in verse 22 my god a saint is angel and as short the lion's mouth as short the lion's mouth plural lions plural mouths plural that they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me before him before god that sent the angel he has looked at my heart he has looked at my inward disposition an innocency was found in me and also before the salvation before the opening you've seen my life external life that i have done no hurt we come to number two now we've seen the experience of sanctification now the evidence of sanctification what's the evidence of sanctification how do i know i am sanctified now that's more important than me judging other people examining other people and finding out about other people is she sanctified is he sanctified mind your business first you may know those who are sanctified those who are not sanctified you may have discernment as to those who are sanctified 
and those who are not sanctified, that discernment of others will not take you to heaven. It's you, yourself, that will find out, am I sanctified? Don't worry about your husband. He breathes, and you don't have to, you know, check up. Is he breathing? He closes his eyes when he needs to sleep. You don't have to get up. Is my husband closing his eyes? Mind your own experience. Find out about yourself. We're checking up on brother so and so. We're checking up on sister so and so. Leave all that alone. You see, all that running after other people, pressurizing other people, goading other people, then that doesn't help you. You lose the time of finding out whether you are sanctified or not. You lose the time of checking out whether you are ready for the coming of the Lord or not. Check up on yourself. Examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith, the faith that brings salvation and the faith that establishes sanctification in our lives. That's what to check up all this, you know, running after other people, to put them in shape and to put them under control and to make sure that they are this or that, you're wasting your life, you're wasting your time. Concentrate on yourself. I see eating is an adult, is a man, he knows when to eat. I see taking water is an adult, she is an adult. The thing is, have I eaten? Have I satisfied my hunger? Have I satisfied my thirst? Have I re-established my relationship with God? That's the profitable thing we have to do. The evidence of sanctification. We're looking at Deuteronomy. And I'm reading from chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. They were ready out of Egypt, saved. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. They already passed through the Red Sea, baptized in water. And they already came over here, and they were already eating and taking the manna that came from heaven. We're already looking at the word of God and having quiet time. But there's still something remaining. The heart. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. You understand? The children of Israel. The reason why he missed the land of promise. Because their hearts were not sanctified, were not circumcised, were not cleansed, because their heart unstable, unsteady, unreliable, always had the mind of what we ate in Egypt, what we enjoyed in Egypt. They forgot the lashes, they forgot the deprivation, they forgot the suffering they had in Egypt. And they were always there because their hearts were not circumcised. By the time you get to the New Testament, their ears were not circumcised. Their minds were not circumcised because they didn't give themselves to the Lord, surrender themselves to the Lord so that their hearts will be circumcised. That's another word for sanctification. The circumcision of heart. At the heart of thy seed, the Lord wanted that sanctification, that circumcision of heart to go from generation to generation. Saved generation to generation. Sanctified, circumcising heart from generation to generation. And what will that produce? To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Sanctification then brings heart circumcision and it makes us to love the Lord 
with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. That, that's what I need to check off. Do I love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, when I'm sad, when I'm glad? Do I love God all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, when I'm happy, when I'm unhappy? Do I allow my wavering emotions and situations to affect my love for God when I have children, when I don't have children, when I've got a job, when I've not got a job, and when things are going my way, and when things are not going my way, do I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. That is the test and the evidence of sanctification. We're looking at John chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment give I unto you. They had become new creatures in Christ. They were saved. Ye are clean through the word which has spoken unto you. They were saved. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. They were saved. I've given them your word, and they have received your word, and the world has hated them. They were saved. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They were saved now. After they became new creatures, and they were saved, a new commandment I give unto you that she love one another. No tribalism. That she love one another. No selection. I love that one. He gives me money. He looks at what I need and he gives me, I love him. Uh -uh. One another. Whether they give you or they don't give you, whether they meet your needs or they don't meet your needs, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you. That's the evidence. Am I sanctified? I need to check off. What how am I doing on the new commandment that Christ has given? Are you sanctified? Don't just say, I prayed, I prayed, and I got something, and I felt something. Uh -uh. No feeling now. What are you doing? How are you doing on the love that Jesus spoke about? That she love one another as I have loved you. That she also love one another. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, by this shall all men know. Here is love. Uh -huh. I love in my heart. People may not see. They may be looking at my frowning face. Let me come out of that and let all men see. My wife is always asking, do you love me? Do you love me? You're looking at my face. You're looking at, you know, whatever. That's why you're asking that. Don't look at anything. We have to look. A face is the expression of what we have in the heart. Our action is the expression of what we have in the heart. When we have sanctification, the evidence of that sanctification, we love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and we love one another, we love the believers as Christ has loved us. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. We can work. We can act, we can put this there, put this there. We can have different attitudes. While we're doing that, that the work appears acceptable and perfect. But the moving of the heart, the attitude of the heart, the disposition of the heart is not of love. And we're doing it correctly, externally, but inside the heart, the love of God is not entrenched, it's not established, 
is not entire in the heart. Let the love of God that we have at all times, without any strings attached, let it show that we have that sanctification. Look at Second Peter chapter 1. In Second Peter chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 3 here. In verse 3 it says, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the evidence of sanctification according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, there's a difference between ye receive. How many of us have the experience somebody give you the gift of a book, good book, and you put it on the shelf? One year, five years, you have not opened the pages. He has given unto us on his own side. He has provided the sanctification experience on the side of Christ by his death on the cross, by the provision of his blood. He has provided all things for his sanctified life, for his sanctified heart. But have we received, have we prayed, have we got that which is said according as his divine power? Have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. That's the evidence of sanctification. Not just the acts outwardly. Not just the behavior outwardly. Not just the actions outwardly. A divine nature that he implants in us divine nature and the divine nature is not just for external behavior outward behavior our inner mind our inner soul our inner disposition what he has given a divine nature and it's that nature that controls us from the inside out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, the hands handle, the feet move, and the eyes see and notice is the heart. And when he gives us that divine nature, it will show forth in our thoughts, in our minds, in our disposition, in the things we do. In the direction we go. And if we are not having the divine nature, it will also show. Because we'll have the human nature. We'll have Adam's nature. We'll have the Adamic nature. We'll have the nature of different kinds of men. But when we're saved, and now we're sanctified, and become new creatures in Christ, and the evidence of that sanctification is that we have the divine nature and the divine nature will help us to be to act to live the way sanctified people live in ezekiel chapter 36 reading from verse 25 ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 then well, I sprinkle clean water upon uh, clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. And from all your filthiness and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. Salvation. And it's the work of God that He Himself sprinkles upon us, not a pastor, not a bishop, not a priest. He sprinkles clean water upon us, and we're clean. All the filthiness, outward expression of sin, taken away 
of the idols. Outward expression of uh, faith in the Lord. All the idols are cleansed of. I will cleanse you. And now, verse 26. It says, and a new heart. This is sanctification. This is the evidence of sanctification. A new heart also. Will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you sanctification in your heart, in your spirit, will I, God, put within you. Now, when somebody has kind of inconsistent action through the spirit, the heart that abides in him, are we going to say it is God? I gave him that inconsistency, that carnality. Are we going to say that the spirit the Lord has put within him to be inconsistent? Of course, no. If our lives are inconsistent, if our disposition, our emotion, inconsistent, up, down, frowning and smiling, knocking, and attractive attractive and attacking if we're up and down here and there and we cannot be predicted that's not coming out of the spirit out of the heart that god has given we check up because this is the evidence of sanctification evidence of sanctification in your heart also will i give you and a new spirit Will I put within you? And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I can find out for myself. I will not know every detail about you. You will know the detail about yourself. Do I have a stony heart? That's all I can check up. I cannot check up about you. Do I have a stubborn will? I can ask myself. You can ask yourself, do I have a rigid disposition after preaching, after praying, after counseling, after everything that people do for me? Am I still as rigid as I have always been? I can check up for myself. You can check up for yourself. The evidence of sanctification is that the stony heart a rigid heart, a stubborn heart, a haughty heart is taken away. And he says, I will give you a heart of flesh. Heart of flesh. Is my heart soft flesh? Is it my labor? Can it be easily controlled? Can it be kind of directed in the right direction? Or is my flesh like bone? Is my flesh like a rock? That although I proclaim to be a Christian, people don't find it easy to live with it, to relate with it. It's of one mind. That's the way he is. And he doesn't care about sanctification. The evidence of sanctification is that the stony heart the rigid heart, the stubborn heart, the rebellious heart is taken away and you have a heart of flesh. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Sanctification. That the evidence of sanctification, the mind of Christ in us, the thoughts of Christ in us, the tenderness of Christ in us, the obedience of Christ in us. But when we live our lives, we're not even asking any question. That thing I'm doing, that way I am going, is this the demonstration? Of the mind of Christ. This kind of atrocious, 
For see, an incorrigible attitude that does not hear any word from anyone. Yes, she comes, then she comes to the meeting. But what has she heard? What has she heard? Where is the evidence of what he has heard all these many years upon his life? Yes, he attends retreats. Yes, he attends crusades. And he is a vocal person for GCK. But where is the evidence of that GCK Emmanuel in his disposition? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what he wants in our lives. Now we're looking at John chapter 12. Reading from verse 24. John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. If self is so pronounced in our lives, you abide alone. Your work bears no fruit. Nobody gets saved through your life, through your action. Your wife will say, if, that, if this is what they teach them in that deeper life, in your deeper life, I cannot go with you. Your husband will say, if this is all deeper life has done in the woman, let them take their deeper life. I cannot go with them. My wife is more terrible than before she, you know, entered deeper life. She used to have at least some outward respect, but now that she's gone to deeper life, deeper, deeper, deeper life, they taught her how to rebel against me, how to be stubborn, how to answer me back. I say one word and she rattles out five words before I finish the one word. You see, when self is there and the carnality is there, uncontrollable, incorrigible, you abide alone. People will say, don't get near him and touch him, it's untouchable. Don't teach him, it's unteachable. Don't train him, it's untrainable. And you don't want to treat him. It's untreatable. You abide alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The evidence of sanctification. Number one, the experience of sanctification. Number two, the evidence of sanctification. Number three, the expectation from the sanctifier. The expectation. He has shed his blood. He has given his life. He has painted the picture. He has sacrificed everything. But now, to see, expect from those who are sanctified and from the people that profess that he really, really sanctified. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Then, after we have heard, of such experience after we have heard of the evidence and we examine our heart and we look up and we know without this no one will see God without this will not get to heaven then shall ye call upon me that's what he expects that now we will call upon him and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Verse 13, and ye shall seek me, and find me, 
when ye shall search for me with all your heart. When we come before the Lord and we say, this is sanctification. Now I understand and I turn everything inward. And now I want, I desire, I pray for this experience of sanctification. And you seek the Lord with all your heart. Everything that hinders us. Talk, talk, talk. Chatting, chatting, chatting. Texting. And using the phone every time. Everything that has come in control with our lives. That even at the time of prayer, we're looking here and there, we're not concentrating. And we cannot pray with all our heart. And they're always calling us. Sir, they need your attention there. They won't allow you to pray. Ma Madam, they need your attention there. They won't allow you to pray. Something is happening here. You must be there. Think about it. All those activities, all those calls, all those disturbances that take you away from the time of praying, asking for their sanctification, will continue like that until the trumpet sounds. And you remain shallow. You remain unsanctified. Your heart remains like it has ever been. Retreat upon retreat. And yet, the harvest is ended. But you are not sanctified. And only the holy, only the sanctified will be there. You want to seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. And you want to really, really pray. And when you pray, what are you asking for? When will you stop the prayer? Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5. Reading from verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit will lead Paul, the apostle, to say, tell them, Christian husbands, love your wives. Think about that. Think about the honeymoon period, the love at that time. Think about when you first proposed the love at that time. Think about the communication Joshua relationship you have at that time. Sijuhade. And think about how you opened up, if you opened up, and shared everything at that time. How about the law now? Religious activities are taking that law away. And all the happenings at home, the things that, that, that have happened, and you have accumulated offense, offense, offense. I'm taking that love away. When we come back to the altar and it sanctifies us, we love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. We love the brethren as Christ loved the church. We love our husbands, we love our wives, we love our children, we love our family as Christ has loved us. We love our neighbors as ourselves we act with thoughtfulness if i do that does that show love towards him if i do that does that show love towards her if i act this way does that show love towards his ministry you think you love husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If I cannot give money, can I give myself? If I cannot give time, can I give myself? It's taking too much of my time. It's taking too much of our time. We don't love him because he takes too much of our time. Time is life. Money is your life, that's your sweat. If you give yourself, you'll give money to the needy, you'll give time to the people that need the time. And you give time to yourself. When you sit down, when you take in the word, and when you spend quality time hearing the word, you're helping yourself. 
You're giving yourself to yourself for your benefit. But if you cannot give anything anymore, hurry, 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 hurry. And when uh, you leave the meeting, you're going to be out there talking, talking, and talking. You're not helping yourself. Love the word. Love the preacher of the word. And give yourself like Christ gave himself. He gave himself for the church. Why? Look at verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. That's what he wants. He wants his church to be glorious. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what we're seeking the Lord for. And that's what we're praying for until it is done. And after it's done. We don't forget sanctification at the bench of, the, of prayer, at the altar of prayer. We experience that sanctification and we take that sanctification away with us back home to the husband. We don't talk about it, we just demonstrate it. Back home to the wife. We don't talk about it, we just demonstrate it. Back home, back to the office, back everywhere. And we hold on to that experience and to that evidence of sanctification, the expectation of the sanctifier. Job chapter 17, verse 9. Job chapter 17, verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way. And he that has clean hands, with clean hearts, shall be stronger and stronger. We live in that experience. We live with that evidence. We live with that expectation of the sanctifier. And we're stronger and stronger in that experience, in the visible demonstration, expression of that sanctification from today. The first day of the rest of our lives until the end of our lives. And faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. He will do it in every life. I said he will do it in every life. We we'll take time to call upon the Lord and to seek the Lord Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without a gaze. Let us go forth, therefore, bearing his reproach let's stand up now and let's seek the lord and the lord that he will do this great work of sanctification in our hearts you can pray you've heard the word already you know about the experience you know about the evidence and you know about the expectation open your mouth and say lord I want this. This must be done.